Hello everybody, welcome to Middle Georgia Spotlight. And of course, as you know, these are trying times here in Middle Georgia and across the nation. With us, we have the uh, North Central Health District. Central Health District. I went over that five times, <laughs> still blew it. We have uh, Michael Hawkinson. He's the information officer there. It means he knows everything that's going on and he's gonna share it with us uh, on this uh, coronavirus situation. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for having me today. What's it like over there at the offices these days? So obviously we are very busy in our response to uh, novel coronavirus, which is also known as COVID-19, which is the disease that novel coronavirus causes. Um, we have our epidemiology team, our infectious disease team, our emergency preparedness team, our nursing team, and of course myself, all working in conjunction to make sure that we're doing the best that we can for our folks here in Middle Georgia. Up until a few days ago, we had no cases in Middle Georgia, meaning that we did not have this problem here, but we just didn't know about it yet. Right. As of March 18th, we, we discovered, we got our first notification of a confirmed case in our district, and that was a individual in Houston County. And since then, we've had several more. We have had additional cases. Including Bibb County. Yes, Bibb County is now on the list of uh, residents with confirmed cases of COVID-19. Can you tell us any more about when you discover something like that, what do your people do? So with COVID-19, it's now one of those reportable conditions that public health has to be notified of by law. Um, there's an entire notifiable disease list and COVID-19 is on there. So as soon as one of the labs, whether it is a private laboratory like LabCorp or Quest or the Georgia Public Health Lab, as soon as they know of a positive, they let our epidemiologists know that there is a case within a specific county within our district. That's if the person yes. goes to a lab or goes to a doctor. What if they choose not to? So if, if a person chooses not to and if they are symptomatic, if they're having cough, uh, respiratory distress, shortness of breath, what they need to do if, they're, if they know that they're not going anywhere, they need to stay home and self-isolate. Um, we don't want any additional cases of COVID-19, and even if it's not COVID-19, we are still in a very active flu season. So that's why now more than ever, we're stressing the importance of, if you are sick, stay home. Don't go to that thing that you wanted to go to that you've been planning for six months, that restaurant that you and all your friends went to that was fun. If you are sick, stay home. You know, in line with that, I, I'm an Alpharetta senator, state senator in Atlanta, wasn't feeling well, but he felt better on the Monday before he had to go back to the legislature for that special session to uh, create the new rules for Georgia and give the governor far-reaching powers to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Went back, got around everybody, and now after it was over, they found out that uh, they have to be quarantined themselves, the entire uh, Senate, state Senate is my understanding. And that's, that's the rule with close contacts. If, if you are confirmed as a close contact of somebody that has been diagnosed with COVID-19, even if you're not symptomatic, if you're not experiencing the coughing or the breathing problems, we ask that those people quarantine themselves for at least 14 days, which is the incubation period of the illness. That way they can see if, if they're healthy, they won't experience those symptoms. But if they experience those symptoms, they'll already be away from people. They can monitor their own symptoms, monitor their temperature, and that's reported to public health. And should those symptoms become more severe, they'll then know they need to contact a healthcare provider to arrange for testing and treatment if necessary. Well, those legislative set, uh, uh, quarters are big and not everybody's gonna be right on top of this guy, but still they want everybody, why, I mean, why that, is that for caution, extra caution or what? This is a situation where it's, it's probably better to be overly cautious than not cautious enough. Um, this is an illness that, as we've seen in places like China, Italy, and areas of the Middle East, it can tear through a community very quickly and have a severe, severe impact on that community. So. While, while certain preventative measures may seem a bit extreme, they're for the good of everybody. They, they, may, they may not be your favorite thing to do. They may make you bored staying at home. They may make you, oh, I wanna go do this, but this is for the good of the community. We wanna make sure to cap this disease off as quickly as possible. Well, uh, the, uh, locally in Houston County a few days ago, you announced that, uh, it, I guess it was a caregiver at a, a, a med stop type place 
Now, this person has seen a lot of folks since he was exposed in another state. And uh, how do you go about trying to run this down and not let it spread further than what it is in Houston County? So that's, that's what we do, or that's what our epidemiology and infectious disease uh, people do in terms of a contact investigation. They'll work with the individual that has that diagnosis. They'll look at their travel history. They'll talk to them about where they've been in the past few days during that infectious period. Try and find out the information of every person they may have had that close contact with, which is within six feet for over 10 minutes of time. Get those names, get contact information, reach out to them and say, you might be a close contact. Here is some information for you. Here's what you need to do to self-quarantine to protect yourself and the community. Here's how you take your own vitals, how you record your own symptoms and report them to public health. And here's exactly what you need to do should any of those symptoms arise. Well, if I was in the mid-stop and had contact with this person and I'm out in the community, what's my chances of spreading that or getting it? Right now, it's, it's been generally accepted that a person is not spreading the illness unless they are symptomatic, unless they are coughing, unless they have the fever. So as long as you are not feeling those symptoms, chances are you are not spreading the illness. And it's several days before those symptoms do pop up, don't they, if, if you're susceptible to it? So there is a range of time for the incubation period. It's two to 14 days before the symptoms start showing up um, in terms of having that first contact. So anywhere from two to 14 days, the median is about five to six days before those symptoms start showing up. So you, that's why that quarantine period is 14 days. So if I'm on that list, have, having visited that bed stop, and these symptoms do show up, what do I do then? Other, other than staying away from folks, will you have me do something else? So with, with our guidance right now, if a person starts experiencing those symptoms, cough, fever, shortness of breath, they need to contact their health care provider immediately. What they'll do then is get information from the individual, talk to them about their symptoms, talk to them about if they've had that close contact with a confirmed case, and screen them for the need for testing. Unfortunately, right now, testing is very limited in the state of Georgia, and it's being prioritized for those at-risk individuals people over age 60, people with current uh, medical conditions like heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, people that are already symptomatic, which would be somebody that experiences symptoms and calls their healthcare provider, or people that have a close confirmed contact with a confirmed case, which would be somebody that had the close contact. Once you contact your healthcare provider and they want to do a test on you, they'll give you measures that you need to take when coming into the facility to limit the chance of exposure to those that are in the facility. Whether it's coming through a specific entrance, we'll put a mask on you to cover up any respiratory droplets, we'll put you in an isolated room and we'll do the testing there. Well, if I pass that next hurdle and they want to test me, mm -hmm. what's that like? So the testing itself, uh, the doctor will consult with a medical epidemiologist up at the State Department of Public Health to determine what needs to happen for testing. If the person meets the criteria for testing, the doctor will take a nasal pharyngeal or oral pharyngeal swab. And what that is basically like is having a stick shoved into your face. If, if, it's, if it's not comfortable, that means they're doing it right. If it doesn't upset you, that means they're probably doing it wrong. How far do they go up there? They have to go far back enough to hit uh, membranes where the viral material will be active and, oh my goodness. and available to be able to be tested. Now, do you think me knowing that and know how that will affect me would keep me from maybe letting you know I got the stuff. I would hope it wouldn't considering the severity of COVID-19. We know that it can lead to severe cases of pneumonia, other respiratory illnesses, and unfortunately in some cases, very s severe cases, death. Right now, about 80% of cases will only experience mild symptoms, but that other 20% may, may have severe symptoms. Although anybody can get this, but there are certain age groups that it's terrible. So the, the data coming out of China and the Middle East and other areas where it's very active is showing that it is mostly in the 50 and older crowd. However, looking at recent information out of Europe, that demographic might be shifting to younger people, age 30, age 40, could go down to 20. Um, here in the U.S., we have a bit of a, a skewed data point on the age demographics because one of the hot spots for COVID-19 in the U.S. was a long-term care facility where older adults 
we're all present living in close quarters. So that's, that's how we have a skew towards the older side right now in the U.S. Basically, uh, it seems like we're shutting down. We're not totally shut down. People are hopefully being a little more careful. And compare this to uh, our flu, which rages through here every year. Uh, you know, we have a lot of deaths that uh, are attributed to our regular flu, whatever that is. That's correct. Um, with flu, obviously, every single year, America does experience quite a large number of deaths when it comes to flu. The difference between flu and COVID-19, however, is the fact that we have a vaccine for flu. We have treatments for flu. Um, you can get vaccinated against flu to protect yourself each flu season. You can have uh, flu symptoms treated. You can take medicines such as Tamiflu to uh, alleviate symptoms. With COVID-19, since it's a brand new disease that just appeared on the world stage back in December, there's still no specific treatment. There's no vaccine. Any, any treatment that a person will receive for COVID-19 will simply be supportive treatment for those symptoms, not for the virus itself. Kind of like the regular flu each year, which is kind of a guessing game how to deal with it. That's why we have so many deaths, isn't that right? That's correct. Obviously, with, with the flu vaccine itself, it's based on predictions about what will be active that particular year. So that the flu vaccine might be particularly effective one year because they guessed correctly or not the next year because they guessed the wrong strains and it might only have a 50% effectiveness. Well, the uh, rules these days, a lot of hand washing. Why hand washing? So hand washing is, is important because you're, you're scrubbing the skin. You're, you're having running water over the skin. You're using that antibacterial soap to make sure that your hands are clean. That's why we say scrub for 20 seconds, sing the happy birthday song twice, and you want to get very, very deep. You might not be doing it right. If, if you're an adult, and especially if you're a child, you don't think about hand washing until you absolutely have to. That's why we've got um, a number of educational materials on our websites that we've been sharing online that show the proper way to wash your hands, which is more thorough than you might expect, such as getting the thumb, getting the back of the hands, going over bracelets, Tips under rings, finger. underneath the fingernails, everything like that. You want to be very, very thorough when you're washing your hands. And after you do that, uh, what about the, uh, the hand sanitizer? How does that work? So with hand sanitizer, that is, that is essentially your backup. If you don't have access to warm soap and water, hand sanitizer that at least has 60% alcohol in it will do, the, will do the trick. Obviously, you want to be able to wash your hands at the next opportunity, but if you do not have access to that soap and water at a particular time, you want to use that 60% alcohol hand sanitizer and use it thoroughly. Make sure you're rubbing it in where you don't have the sticky feeling on your hands to where it's actually getting and using being used effectively. So if you're out and you use the hand sanitizer and you get home, you want us to wash our hands when we get home? Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend washing your hands as soon as you get home. You don't really think about the things that you touch even between driving from work or driving from school to home. What if you stop for gas, you're touching that gas pump. What if you went to the store, you're touching things that other people might have touched. When you go home, you definitely want to wash your hands. I was out at uh, Macon Mall. It's uh, still open and uh, to walk, mall walker. And a couple of people we see every day out there came with masks on. You uh, recommend that? So right now, CDC is specifically not recommending masks um, for those that are not ill. If you're not actually coughing, if you're not sneezing, you don't really need to use a mask right now. Masks should be used for those that are coughing, that are sneezing, that are creating those respiratory droplets that might contain infectious material, then the mask will cover that and eliminate the actual spread in the air. Um, in addition to that, obviously, there has been a shortage of masks across the country and across the world, and that's partially because one of the main manufacturers for these masks is China, and their industry is almost completely shut down still. Um, we are working with our healthcare providers locally to try and get supplies to them as needed. Um, luckily, we haven't seen any drastic shortages yet, but that's why, as you may have seen in presidential addresses, now they're talking about having construction companies donate their own industrial masks, the, the, the ones with HEPA filters, the, the ones that are rated for construction to healthcare facilities, just to supplement the stock that they already have. And if those folks out at the mall were coughing or sneezing, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. Is that exactly. Right? If you are sick, you don't need yeah. to be wall mall walking. Yeah, well, that's great. Um, the uh, uh, distance between each other, what are they calling that? Uh, social distance. Social distance, Yes. which we aren't right now. 
<laughs> we're 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 getting we're we're nudging on the danger Close zone. Enough. Yeah, we're nudging on the danger zone. So the rule is six feet, um, and six feet is the generally accepted rule of that is the farthest that a droplet can go when somebody is sneezing or coughing. Um, that's why the rule when it comes to those close contacts with individuals of confirmed COVID-19 cases is, were you within six feet of them for longer than 10 minutes? Then that is probably going to be a close contact. How are your folks going out into the field these days? What do they do and where do they go? So right now it's a lot of education. Um, the health departments aren't doing individual testing, but what we're doing is working with our local hospitals, we're working with our local healthcare coalitions, which are regional healthcare coalitions, our groups of hospitals, long-term care facilities, urgent, urgent care facilities, med stops, things like that, that all work together for situations like this so they can share knowledge and resources. Um, in addition to them, we work closely with schools and businesses that are seeking guidance for things like, what should I do if an employee has COVID-19? or they're diagnosed with it, what should I do to protect my own business, what should I do to protect my customers and the students and everyone else that might come into my facility. Not every store is shutting down. So what are they doing? Are they trying to space out their customers, limit times in that place, or what? So while public health is not mandating specific measures, the guidance that we are giving, or hopefully, hopefully people and business owners are taking those into consideration. Um, in supplementing their own emergency plans or their own respiratory illness outbreak plans. Um, I know a lot of restaurants are looking more towards delivery options. They're looking more towards those takeout options and customer spacing. Uh, businesses are looking at how they can do teleworking to not have people actually at the facility itself but be able to work from home. And of course, as you know, with our school district, they're, they're pushing out uh, telelearning systems where students can learn and do assignments online. If I uh, call in uh, to get a takeout order, how am I assured that those folks behind the scenes making that uh, sandwich are up to speed? So one of the things with the restaurants is that they work very closely with the, the Department of Public Health for our environmental health side. That's the, the body that uh, does the permits, that does the inspections. We gave all of our restaurants here locally guidance on what exactly they need to do to make sure that their customers are completely safe when it comes to those delivery options, those dine-in options, because that is that is what the Environmental Health Department does. They make sure that people can go out in their community and healthily interact with each other and not have to worry about illness. What are some of the requirements to handle food uh, in these days are? So obviously with these days, we want to make sure that people are taking extra precaution, use, utilizing those gloves, making sure that they're washing more frequently than they might be washing normally. Um, more frequent cleaning and disinfection, as well as following the uh, CDC guidelines specifically for cleaning and disinfection. There is also a, a group of products that is pushed out by the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, that is registered to work against COVID-19. It's an ever-changing list, and all of our restaurants have that information shared from the Department of Public Health, so they know that they're getting a product that will work in their facility. They bring that sack of food out to us at the curb, mm -hmm. supposedly. And uh, is there any danger with taking that sack into the house or does anything stay on that paper bag or plastic bag? So right now, since COVID-19 is something that's still new, we don't really know 100% how it interacts with services. However, when we're talking about person to person, as long as that interaction is over six feet or under 10 minutes, they'll be fine. Under 10 minutes, I hadn't heard that much. Yep, you wanna make sure that if, if they're within that six feet range, it's got to be under 10 minutes. That helps. Yep. Any other suggestions on that end of, about not being contaminated by another person? Um, the, the biggest suggestions there too is obviously we've had a lot of event cancellations so this you might not have the opportunity but if you're going into places where you see large crowds maybe go the other way. Um, if you're planning travel to areas that are active for COVID-19 community spread especially in areas of the US, New York, Seattle, California, there's areas that present a higher risk for individuals to come into contact with COVID-19. Now is the time to look at those plans. Maybe cancel them, maybe set delays or reschedule, um, but of course, we want you to be safe and look at your own life and look at your own risk. Due to the plight of the airlines that we're learning in the news that uh, business is way down, mm -hmm. people are apparently heeding these suggestions. And that's good. Um, it is unfortunate that it will have an impact on our economy, but 
I believe the health and safety of the American people is more important than the economy when it comes to something so new and so rapidly changing day to day. The idea is to get this over with as quick as we can. Yes, and that's, that's, why, that's why, like I said before, these measures that are being put in place across the country might seem extreme now, but if we can cap off COVID-19 as early as possible, we won't become an Iran, an Italy, a France, a UK. We need to be able to protect the American people from this new illness. Well, there's no reason not to believe that we'll have a lot more cases here in middle Georgia. The next step is how are our medical facilities, such as the, the med stops, uh, uh, the doctors, and the hospitals, what are they doing? So they're the ones that are heavily involved in actually doing the testing. Um, they're doing, well, testing itself might be a little bit of a misnomer when looking at the actual facility where they, they're doing sample collection and sending it off to laboratories. And of course, once a person does have COVID-19 and if they develop severe symptoms, they're, they're where the person's going to go. They're going to be hospitalized should they have very severe symptoms. That's why they're taking stock of their own inventory, they're looking at their own ICUs, they're looking at their own hospital bed inventory to make sure that we are well prepared should further confirmed cases be found in our district. Vast, vast majority of people will live through this thing, but the but a lot of the deaths, majority of the deaths, almost all of the deaths are with seniors in these other countries. That's correct. Um, a lot of the deaths are in the demographic of 60 and older, and a lot of the deaths are in 60 and older with existing health conditions like heart disease, lung disease. And that's, that's the same thing when you look at flu. A lot of the deaths are older. When we get older, we, we have a more weakened immune system. And if we already have an existing medical condition, an illness like the flu or COVID-19 will only cause that existing condition to become worse. And that can lead to a higher strain on the body, which of course can lead to death. The other day, uh, the Cherry Blossom Festival here in uh, Middle Georgia is our biggest event of the year. And right up to the mouth of the wind's supposed to open, mm -hmm. we had to call it off. Yes. And uh, Mayor Rickert made a great presentation at uh, the cancellation meeting. Mm -hmm. And he said that most people could go through this thing and get through it, but they'll carry it home to the seniors. And of course, we'll have a lot of senior citizens coming into town too. That's correct. And uh, what led up to that decision? So that, that was in a decision that was uh, made in conjunction with public health as well as the emergency management agency here in Macon Bibb. Uh, we gave our, our own guidances, our own recommendations, and it was, it was left to the, the Cherry Blossom Board to determine the cancellation. Obviously they saw the risk, especially when it comes to our, our older generation, not only here locally, but we have hundreds of thousands of visitors coming from all across the country. A, a giant open air festival like that could potentially expose a high number of people should a, a confirmed COVID case be involved in a large gathering like that. So for the safety of the people, I believe it was the right decision to cancel. And even if it was just young people going out, yes. they carry it back home to granddad. And that's correct. That's And that's what, what I know that the, uh, the at presidential press conferences, that's one of the things that was stressed. For the young people, make sure you're doing your own part to, to help stymie the spread of the disease. While, while it might not be affecting your age group in particular, you can take steps to help those. If you have older loved ones, neighbors, anything like that, offer them help. See what their situation is. See if you can help them get groceries where they don't have to go into a packed grocery store. See if you can help them get their medicine. See if you can help them just around with with anything that they might need, especially if they are, like I said, an older person or if they have an existing medical condition that might be exacerbated by an additional strain on their system. Speaking of groceries, uh, what's the situation in our grocery stores? So obviously we've all seen the pictures, we've seen the videos of people going to grocery stores, buying up toilet paper, buying up supplies. Um, while that might seem a little extreme and I'm, I'm of the opinion that some of it is a little extreme we do know that a lot of those videos come from areas with active community spread um, we do in emergency preparedness which is I, I work in emergency preparedness for public health our guidelines even in non-emergency situations are a person should be able to have enough supplies on hand to last 72 hours for themselves and every member of their family 
that's, that's standard emergency preparedness for the American public. Um, it is a good idea to have things in place should you have to stay home for an extended period of time, whether it's your own supplies, your own medication, or means to communicate with people. Those are things that people need to be thinking about, not just now, but in everyday situations, but it is more important now. It's causing them to buy more than normal, just in case. A lot of people are worried about a total shutdown, like over in those other countries. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something that hopefully we won't have to go to that extreme, um, but people should be prepared for it should that eventuality happen. Uh, right now I know that we're, we're doing everything we can to make sure that continuity of services, uh, continuity of operations in a lot of those essential services remain active, remain day to day. Um, we just want people to be prepared, but not to the point where it's, it's affecting other people that need it as well. You know, long term you think about that because our flu season every year is a bigger toll than people really realize. This could do nothing but help us in the future deal with that too, some of these precautions that we're taking for the cornea virus. Yes, and this, this whole situation is new. It's a new illness where we're having to implement extreme measures where we've never done something on this level before. And this is the first declared public health emergency. So public health is doing things that we, we have planned for for years in terms of pandemic flu. Those plans have now been implemented into COVID-19 preparedness plans. Michael, how has this affected your job? You're the public information office. You're not the guy that sticks the things up the nose or anything like that, but you have to be right in the middle of everything. How has this changed your job around? Well, I definitely don't want to be the person sticking the stick in somebody's nose. Um, that I'll leave that to the professionals. Um, in terms of where I'm at, what I'm doing, I've, there's been a lot of uh, working with our local partners, our EMAs, our local county and city governments, um, local hospitals to coordinate education, to coordinate messaging, making sure that we're all on the same page, getting correct information out. Obviously, with a new illness like this, it is ample opportunity for misinformation, scams, and other bad info to make its way into the, the public knowledge. Um, we've been doing rumor control and making sure that people get the most up-to-date, correct information as possible as it's released by CDC, the Department of Public Health, and here locally. What are you telling our police department? Well, our police department... Um, our sheriff's department here at Macon. Our sheriff's department. We definitely want them to be to be safe. Um, obviously, they come in close contact with people all the time. We ask that they adhere to those guidance and guidelines that CDC has put out specifically for law enforcement officials, review their plans, make sure that they're implementing some of those new guidelines. Some people really were at our jails where people are confined fairly closely. Mm -hmm. They have to be uh, specially uh, trained to do with this. And that's, that's obviously jails are a, a potential hotspot for yeah. COVID-19. Jails in themselves have been hotspots for the spread of any kind of disease that moves quickly between a, a very close-knit community, whether it's a gastrointestinal illness like norovirus or a respiratory illness like flu. So COVID-19 is, is obviously a threat to those prisons, and that's why guidance is being developed specifically for those prisons where they can um, implement it into their own plans and hopefully make sure that their own uh, staff and the inmates are safe from this new illness. When I think of public information officer, I think of you dealing with uh, us media types, but it's not just that. You're all over the place. Yes, um, I'm, I'm, I am working closely with our local media to make sure that they get up-to-date information, but I'm also um, talking with residents that have questions. Um, I'm trying to answer questions on our Facebook pages as much as possible, and I apologize if you're not getting the answer that you want very quickly. Um, but we, we are very, very busy in public health right now. So staying safe and uh, being careful are key parts of all of this. Yes, taking those preventative measures are the absolute best thing you can do for yourself and your community right now. Well, Michael Hawkinson, uh, we appreciate what you're doing in all of this and hope we can level out soon and get this behind us and start the baseball season, for goodness sakes. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people miss sports right now. Oh, yes we do. <laughs> thank you again for thank being you for with us. Me. Yes. Hi, and thank you for being with us on the Middle Georgia Spotlight. 
I'm in for former Macon Mayor Jack Ellis, Ron Wildman, WMUB-TV.